Good morning. We're glad you've joined us for this Sunday morning service. Tusculum Hills Baptist Church is a caring and vibrant church that offers God's help to all people. We invite you to join us now for a special message from God's Word. What an encouragement it is to see such a good crowd here on this dreary January morning. Today, I want to talk to you about the more side of the Christian life. The more side of the Christian life. Let's say our confession this morning. Oz, if you can pull that up for us. Let's say it together. I believe the Bible. It is the Word of God. Every word of God is true. If the Bible says something that disagrees with my attitudes, my beliefs, my opinions, or my traditions, I will change with the power of the Holy Spirit. Would you turn with me to Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. I've got several passages of Scripture this morning. This is the, the first one. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. The first thing that I want you to hear from today's message is this. There's more to being saved than just being saved. There's more to being saved than just being saved. Titus chapter 2, starting with verse 11, says this. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of, of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, let me explain. When a person comes to faith in Jesus, this is what we call being saved. Most of you have been saved. Most, of us are talk, most people will talk about when they were saved. And sometimes when people talk about when they were saved, they will talk about it as if it were a, just an event that happened in the far distant past long ago. I knew a young man once who, was, who said that he was saved at a Billy Graham crusade in Minneapolis when he was a little boy visiting his grandparents there one summer. And we talked about this conversion experience. The interesting thing, though, is that he showed no interest in spiritual things whatsoever, none. And I talked to him on numerous occasions about this, but he was convinced that he was saved. And I remember saying, but if you're saved, why, why would you not want to be a part of a church? Why would you not want to read your Bible? Why would you not want to pray? Why would you not want to grow as a Christian? And he, he just wasn't tracking with me. His idea of salvation was the same uh, as if he talked about a trip that his parents took him, took him to Six Flags when he was a boy. We went to Six Flags when I was 10. And he saw salvation in, this, in a similar way. I got saved at this place and time. But just as Six Flags didn't change his life, it appears that whatever this religious experience was didn't change his life either. So to him, there really wasn't much difference between going to an amusement park and going to the Billy Graham crusade. But truthfully, we know, and I hope you know this as a growing believer, that salvation is only the beginning. It's entry level. It's, it's Christian 101. Salvation is just the beginning. It's the beginning of a new life. The scripture talks about being born again, which is a great picture of being born again. John chapter 3. And this new beginning is about having a purpose in life. And it's also a, a beginning of a new way of thinking because now a saved person has a new perspective, a new earthly perspective through the eyes of an eternal perspective. And then being saved is more than just being saved. It's the beginning of new friends, friends who laugh together. Uh, friends who cry together, friends who pray for each other and share many good stories <laughs> and many good times as well as sad times. I talked to an older woman who was a widow and she said that she's so glad she has her church 
What would she do without her church? How lonely would life be without her church? Then she started talking about the different elements of joy she has found in her church. And she said, even at that moment where you get tickled in church and you just can't stop laughing, I don't think we've, have, have we had any of those since I've been here? I'm not sure. I haven't noticed anybody that just gets so tickled. But have you ever had that happen in church? You just, you just can't stop laughing. You know, that doesn't really bother me because I'd rather you be happy than sad. As long as you're not laughing at my sermon. But think about all those times and those experiences that, that a person wouldn't have had if they didn't have this new life in Christ. Salvation is the beginning of a three-part process. See, it's not just a one-time event. It's the beginning of a three-part process. I can say this. I can say, I was saved. I am currently saved, and I will continue to be saved. And these, this three-part process has three elements. Justification, which means I have been saved from the penalty of sin. And the penalty of sin is hell. Next is sanctification, which means I am saved from the power of sin. And what this means is walking in the Spirit and yielding to Him helps me. It helps us to avoid sin currently. And then next is glorification. I will be saved from the presence of sin. In the future, in heaven, there will be no sin. There will be no concept of sin. We can't even, we can't even imagine what that's like. Now, listen to me on this. If the only reason you were saved was to prevent you from going to hell, then the moment you were saved, you would have just been zapped right out of here if that were the only reason. But since we are still here, and as we understand the Scripture, we learn that God has a purpose for us post-salvation experience. He has a purpose for our lives. He has a purpose for this collective body being together. It's not just a club of people. It's not just a social group, even though those things happen. We are saved for a purpose as individual, individuals, and we are saved as a, for a purpose collectively. Now, part of this purpose is that God wants us to have fellowship with Him. Before He takes us to heaven, He wants us to have fellowship with Him on this earth. He wants to be the most integral part of your life, consuming all that you are. So, being saved is more than just being saved. And I hope that when you look back at your salvation experience, whenever it was, might have been when you were a child, a teenager, or an adult, but I hope when you look back on that experience, it's not this far distant memory, but it's a memory of a beginning that brings you to now. And the next, there is more to being baptized than merely going under the water. Two boys were talking about their upcoming baptism, and one of the boys said, Did you know, uh, my papa said, when you go under the water, your sins are washed away. And the other boy said, Well, I want to go first so that I don't have to wade in your sins. <laughs> Turn with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, starting with verse 1, says this, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. There's more to being baptized than merely going under the water. And before anyone is baptized, I want people to understand the joyous meaning of baptism. Many don't know that there's a proper order the scripture talks about first salvation, then baptism. 
not the other way around. It's not baptism, then salvation. And this is why we as Baptists do not practice infant baptism. And I've talked with uh, three friends of mine who are pastors in other traditions. Uh, they love the Lord. They are strong believers. And I have felt comfortable enough with them to ask them about their practice of infant baptism in their churches. And they've given me reasons. They've even given me a, a scripture or two that seemed to me to be stretching it. And I've, I've sincerely inquired about this belief, but none of them have given me convincing arguments or convincing scripture. Now, I don't wish to mar their tradition, but as Baptists, we practice believers' baptism. Baptism is for believers. It's not for people who are too young to understand. We hold that one must be old enough to be a believer before baptism. And, and having said that, baptism is not to be taken lightly, but it's to be entered into with understanding, uh, with sincerity, and with joy. Think about the picture, the symbolic picture that Romans 6 gives us right here of baptism, of being buried with Christ. And Christ resurrected from the dead. And then when we come out of the water, there is the symbol. We are identifying with Christ's resurrection. What a wonderful privilege, symbol, picture, or drama with you being the actor of baptism. You know, this wedding ring that I wear means that I got married, and it means that I'm still married. Now, a few years ago, I broke my ring finger right here on the joint. So it's, it's almost nearly impossible for me to take this ring off. Since I broke that finger and my joint swelled there, I, I, I may have had it off twice. But that's okay. When you see this ring, it means that I got married and that I'm still married. It's an outward symbol of an inward decision to marry someone who said yes, by the way. <laughs> Baptism is an outward symbol of an inward expression and a decision to be a follower of Jesus. So we need to make sure we get the order right. We need to make sure that we understand what baptism is. And we need to make sure that it follows the symbolic nature as prescribed and explained in Romans chapter 6 and in other scriptures. Now, it's possible someone here was baptized and then later became a follower of Jesus. Let me share something with you. There's nothing wrong with you getting the order right. If you've gotten it out of order, you can get the order right. My parents, when I was a little boy, started going to church when I was about four years old. I remember when we first went to church. And I remember my father telling my mother, we need to join the church and we need to be baptized. So they went under the water. And my dad, who grew up in a Christian home and knew better, felt terribly guilty about what he had done and led my mother to do. And then one day, my dad surrendered and was saved. And he told my mom, we've not done this right. And then my dad said, started telling my mother about this. And I remember my mother weeping. I mean, I mean weeping. And so my dad didn't know what to do. This is before he went into the ministry. And he called the pastor of our church. And the pastor came, and we had a very large family Bible. And he took that big family Bible out, and he showed my mother scriptures about being saved and told her how she could pray to repent of sin and follow Jesus. And I, I remember that as vividly as if it happened yesterday because of the change that happened in my family when I was a little boy. And then my parents went before the church and said, we need to do it right this time. So you might be here this morning and maybe you've got the order wrong. It's okay to get the order right because you've got a congregation of people here who are going to love you and support you and be understanding 
if you got the order wrong. How many of you would be excited this morning to know that somebody decided to get the order right? All of you, right? Everyone? You're going to be supportive. Nothing to be embarrassed about there. Listen to this. 1 Peter 3.21 tells us that baptism gives us a good conscience toward God. What an interesting scripture. I have thought about this scripture for hours. That baptism gives us a good conscience toward God. You know, it might be that you've had this phantom doubt that's plagued you over the years. It's just nagged you. Perhaps you've had the order wrong, or perhaps you haven't been baptized, and, and there's this doubt that plagues you. It's okay to get it right, because the Bible says right here that baptism gives us a good conscience toward God. I think part of the reason God gave us baptism is that we could, we could take something that's rather abstract, a decision, a prayer, and turn it into something concrete by being baptized. Well, don't be proud if you've got the order wrong. Don't be proud if you've never been baptized and need to be baptized. Everyone here will be glad for you. Now next, I want to say this to you that in this Christian life, there is more to prayer than merely saying a prayer. How many of you have learned that? When children learn to pray, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. How many of you learned that as a child as one of your first prayers? But as we become older, our prayers need to become more meaningful. They need to become um, uh, deeper and they need to communicate clearer with God. Matthew chapter 6 verse 7 says this, And when you pray, don't keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Then the Bible also gives us examples of Pharisees who prayed and wanted people to hear them pray their, their, their beautifully written verbose prayers. And then we had over here a tax collector who just said, God help me, a sinner. So when I'm talking about this prayer here, I'm not talking about beautiful public prayers. I'm talking about communicating with God. All too often, though, I believe that Christians don't grow beyond the basic prayer. Let me ask you, have you ever sought to improve your communication with others? Have you ever said something and as you walked away or came to you a little later, you know, I don't think that came out right. I really hope for a second chance to improve my communication. We've all done that with family. We've done that with friends. We've done that with employers. And how, how many times have you carefully thought through something before you said it? And then after you said it, evaluated yourself, right? And at some point you've got to let it go, right? Well, our prayers need to be something that we consider seriously. Your one-on-one -on -one prayer time with God, what is it like? Is your prayer life growing? You know, the Bible gives us examples of different types of prayers. I believe that all of us would benefit from a, a thorough study on prayer. There are at least six examples of prayers in the Bible. The first is the agreement prayer. This is when you and someone else pray for something specific. Matthew 18, verse 19 says, Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning, concerning anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Jesus said that. The agreeing prayer. It would be like I would go to Terry or Bill and say, Gentlemen, will you join me in a prayer, a specific prayer about Tusculum Hills Baptist Church? And then we agree to unify in prayer on whatever that is. That's the agreeing prayer. And we also have next is the, the requesting prayer. <clears throat> this is the pr prayer we're most familiar with because as human beings, we sure like to make our requests to God, don't we? Some call it the prayer of faith. This is a prayer where we request something with a particular outcome. Jesus said in Mark chapter 11, verse 24, Therefore I say unto you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you will receive them and you will have them. But you know, Jesus doesn't give us a timeline, does he? 
And that's where we get frustrated. Then in our prayers, we also have prayer within the will of God. Luke chapter 22, verses 41 and 42, we see an outline of prayer, a prayer of consecration, a prayer of dedication. This is, well, this is when we don't know what to pray. When Jesus said, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me, meaning the, what was about to happen to him in the crucifixion, nevertheless, not my will but yours be done. I think the prayer within the will of God is the prayer that we pray when we don't know what to do. We are faced at the fork of the in the road. We have to make a decision to do this or that. And sometimes I found out the fork in the road might be three forks in the road that have six choices. And I pray and say, God, I don't know which direction to take, so I'm praying to be within your will. Show me what your will is. Then we have the prayer of praise. The psalmist, Mary's prayer, and numerous other examples in the Bible tell us and show us how to pray prayers of praise. I heard a person teaching once on fasting and prayer. And this particular person said, the next time you feel called to a fast, fast in gratitude to God for who He is, not because you want something. What, a, what, a, what an interesting way to think about fasting and prayer, the prayer of praise. Then we have intercessory prayer, and this is ongoing prayer on behalf of someone or something. It might be on behalf of someone who is too far away from the Lord to pray. Maybe they're strung out on drugs, or maybe they've just made a series of bad decisions, and, and you are praying for that person. Intercessory prayer could be for a congregation. It's something that you don't pray once. It's something that you continually pray. And you put this petition before God, not because he's deaf, but because you're sincere and wanting to see it happen. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, Therefore I also, after heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, and that you may know what is the hope of His calling, what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. If any of you want to pray that for me, please do. Intercessory prayer. And then we have the prayer of repentance, a prayer that we probably don't pray enough. If there's any prayer that we all should be familiar with, it should be the prayer of repentance. And there are other types of prayers in the Bible. Daniel prayed on behalf of a nation. David asked for forgiveness. And don't forget that tax collector I mentioned earlier who said, God be merciful to me, a sinner. The prayer of repentance is the first prayer that God hears from somebody. So when we pray... I like to use the ACTS acronym, A-C-T-S. Adoration, praising God for who He is. Confession, Lord, forgive me for what I've done. Forgive me of my sins. Thanksgiving, thanking God for what He's done, what He continues to do. And then supplication or request that you want to make known to God. Well. There's more to being saved than just being saved. There's more to being baptized than merely going under the water. There's more to praying than just saying a prayer. You know, as believers, there's more to being a church member than just merely having your name on a church membership roll. Now, if you are a saved, baptized believer with a growing prayer life, all three of these things I just mentioned, then it goes to reason that your church membership should be meaningful to you. In the book of Acts, we have a fantastic history of the early church. If you ever aren't sure what to read in the Bible, open up to the book of Acts. It reads like a novel. It just reads like a story. It would make a great movie. <laughs> Acts 2.46 tells us a characteristic of early Christians. This is right after the church grew by over 3,000 people in one day. This characteristic is this, that they had glad and sincere hearts. That's what the scripture says. 
The scripture doesn't say that they grew according to their gossip, the Lord added to their number that was being saved, or according to their negativity or complaining, or according to how they kept things stirred up, but because of their glad and sincere hearts, everyone saw that these people meant business. So here we are, starting a new year. And I am encouraged to see this crowd on this dreary Sunday in January. I believe this is a, I hope this is a sign of good things to come. But I hope that your church membership means more to you than just having your name on a church roll. I hope that you'll seek out your place of service and that you'll approach it like the early Christians in Acts 2 with a sincere and glad heart. So, in 2014, let's... Uh, Let's seek unity. Um, let's, let's avoid gossip and other church killers. Let's come together for the cause of Christ. Well, this morning I've attempted to share with you that there's more. There's more to this phrase, being a Christian, than just the phrase, being a Christian. There's more to it. Let's return to this scripture in Titus chapter 2 that I read earlier. Verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, one of these days he's going to return. Either he raptures us out <laughs> or we're going to die before the rapture. But one of these days, it's going to happen. Until then, we are to be faithful. And we are to take this call to be a Christian seriously. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Lord, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for dying on that old rugged cross so many years ago and saving us from our sins. Thank you for paying the penalty for us so that we don't have to pay the penalty for sins. And Lord, it seems like all of us try to do what we can to, to pay you back, but we can't do it. We've just got to offer you the broken pieces that we are in a spirit of humility and repentance, accept your salvation, and then go forward because we can never repay you, Jesus, for what you've done for us. Now, Help all of us, as we've heard this today, as I've prepared for this, even myself, and was shown some things that I need to think about. Help all of us to take this role, this reality, this life of being a Christian seriously. Let us do it with joy, glad and sincere hearts. Help us to live for you every day so that the world around us will know that there's something different like the people that saw the new Christians in the book of Acts. Lord, help us as we start a new year to be unified, to love each other. Let's look forward to good things that you're going to do in us, among us, and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've not accepted Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, you can sure do that this morning. If you did that just now, we sure do want to know about it. We've got two men that will be standing down front along with me. If you've got that baptism order wrong and you want to get it right, you can do that. We'd like for you to do that today. Let's stand together as we sing our invitation hymn. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed.